We began last Sunday um, to talk about the coming of Christ in this season that, for the most part, most Christians remember his birth. And we went to the very beginning in the Word of God, to Genesis, because it is from there that God begins to announce the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. Christ means the anointed one, one that has been anointed. And those that were anointed back in those days, they were anointed for a mission, for a purpose, especially, for example, kings. They would be anointed in order to perform and lead uh, the people. Uh, as their ruler. Well, the Bible, at the very beginning, God announces the coming of Christ, the birth of a Savior, the mission of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus right after man falls. Let us go back there again to Genesis chapter 3, because we would like to share with you some prophecies about the coming of Christ and what this means to our lives. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, we read that proclamation, that prophecy, that annunciation that God gave in the Garden of Eden. Right there at the very beginning, when man fell at the instigation and temptation of Satan, here is what God says in Genesis 3, 15. The word reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Last Sunday we spoke that from the very beginning God has announced the coming of a seed. This is the first Christmas annunciation. This is what the shepherds heard from the angels. The fulfillment of what God here in Genesis 3.15 is saying. A seed will come. The seed of the woman will come upon the earth. Will come to the world. But it's interesting that we look at the context in which this coming is. And we uh, saw last Sunday that the context is one of enmity. Hostility antagonism, warfare. And it would, it would appear to some, but pastor, during the time of Christmas, we talk about peace, and we talk about love, and we talk about joy. Yes, we do that, and we certainly make reference to that, because that's what the seed has brought. But... Let us not forget why Jesus Christ came to this world. We were saying last Sunday that we need to bring Christmas into perspective. That the Christmas that we celebrate today or the world celebrates or the people that don't have Christ as their Savior celebrate is one that may be about gifts, that may be about reconciliation, that may be about sitting together with families and friends and sharing a good meal or resting or lighting up uh, your place. It's a special time of the year indeed. I sense it in my heart. But the problem is that people do not comprehend what it is that Christians proclaim during this time. And we said last Sunday, by looking at this verse, that the coming of Christ came into a world that was torn by strife, by warfare, not by peace, by lack of peace. And that rages in the heart of men. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, came into a world that was in darkness. Came into a world where people's hearts were in darkness and in rebellion against them. And that's where all the warfare spills out of. We have been shaken by the events in Connecticut. And it's become a bittersweet, a bittersweet uh, experience for us, especially at this time of the year in our nation. But then we were trying to put Christmas in perspective by saying that in this world we live in the midst of a battle. That the world is not a playground. 
We know the saying of Americans that we work hard so that we may play hard. And it seems like that is the motto of the world, the mantra that they live by. All I get to do is work hard, make lots of money so I can play hard, not knowing that a battle for the souls of people, that a battle for the souls of men and women rages every day because God said there's enmity. And there will be enmity between the Christ, the anointed one of God, and Satan, between the followers of Christ, between God's people and the followers of Satan and the followers of the current of this world. And this antithesis, what does that mean, Pastor? This division, this fight has always been there and will always be there. And it's the reason why the world, in this world, we will suffer. Why? Because we live in a fallen world where when we come to Christ and see him as the seed, as the savior, as the king of the universe, as soon as we do that, and as soon as we submit to his lordship and to his leading and guidance in my life, now I have put myself contrary to the current of the seed of Satan. How many of you experience that? And have experienced that in your lives. If you're not experiencing that, the will has become a playground for you. And you are living in a world of fantasy. Because great fantasy and illusion is the type of life that the world lives in. Thinking that there is no God. Or that there is a God of their own imaginings that it's all going to be all right, they drink and be merry, and tomorrow they die, and maybe they just go and walk to the light. You hear that with people, right? Tomorrow they will just enter into some kind of an existence after they die, and it's all going to be all right because after all, I've been a good person. People are deceived, and they're going to have a crude awakening at the other end of this life. They're going to have a rude, crude disillusionment when they stand face to face with Almighty God, with the Creator of heavens and earth, with the one that has put this world under a law to worship Him and to, and to love Him and to give Him all that we are and we don't. Nobody has. We're all sinners. We have all fallen short, and the holy God, law of God testifies to that. But then he has made provision in the Son that came precisely to live under the law that you and I could not fulfill. That law of commandments, that holy, righteous, and perfect law that is summed up in, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That law that we do not satisfy and fulfill and meet because our hearts, we have a sinful nature. And Jesus Christ came to save sinners like that. It was announced right here that in the midst of an enmity, of a hostility, and it's not just the hostility of bullets flying in the air or bombs or rockets dropping on a specific geographical place. It's the bombs, the rocket, and the warfare of your heart. That enmity that you had against God. That rebellion for turning your back against God. Today, once again, if you're here, God's given you a chance to hear there's forgiveness in Christ Jesus. There is reconciliation in my son. I've came to save sinners. I've came to save the lowly in heart. I've came to save those that acknowledge their rebellion, that acknowledge their not being able to satisfy my perfect law. And if you will just by faith acknowledge me and bow down before me and say, Lord, please save me, then you are translated from being a children of the seed of Satan to being a children of light and a children of the seed of the Messiah. 
it's still a battle, a battleground. You are translated now from the illusion that you're in control, that the world is a playground, that everything is all right, that you just need to be a good person, or you can just live whichever way you want, and it's going to be all right at the end, that there's no holy God, that Jesus Christ is a myth and a fable. You're translated from that onto the reality of being in the Son, in Jesus Forgiven, accepted by grace, only by faith. Received of the Father in the perfect sacrifice of the Son and declared, accepted, not guilty. Justified in the eyes of God because the blood of Jesus was shed to cleanse your sin, stained soul. And to do away with your rebellion and to change your heart. To a, from a heart of stone to a heart that loves him and that seeks him. But that puts you right in the middle of a battleground with the awareness that the world is not a playground, but it is a battleground. And in a battleground, we suffer. In a battleground, we shed tears. In a battleground, we sweat. In a battleground, we have a mission to do. And I want to read to you this morning before we go back to some other prophecies, let me, let me take you to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, we are given uh, the way that Christians live, the way that now the reality of being in the Son appears to us. And it's found there in 2 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to what it says here in 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 8. In, in verse 7, it says, but we have this treasure. What treasure? It says that we have a treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The treasure that we have is Christ. Christ announced to us, received by us in the gospel. And the Apostle Paul says, we have received a treasure, the pearl of great price, that which the parable says a man found in the ground and sold everything he had and came and bought the ground. That treasure who is Christ is announced in the gospel. The Emmanuel, Son of God, that came to die for sinners and rose again that sinners will be reconciled. But now we have this treasure, it says in what? In vessels of clay. Notice, when we put the coming of the Messiah in perspective, we're going to have a worldview that is biblical. And we're going to understand that we are weak. That our existence in our flesh is weak. That we are nothing of our own. That we're here today and gone tomorrow. That our thoughts and plans and purposes without God come to naught, come to null. They are unprofitable. They are useless. The Bible says all is useless without God. But with Christ, now notice how the true meaning of what it means to be a Christian, and because we're now in the Son, notice now what it becomes. It says here, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. There's power. There's power in the life of a Christian. Power to do what? To keep on believing. To keep on confessing the name of Christ. To keep on loving our God. To keep on every day that we fall, we get back up and look unto heaven. And we see the one that is our sacrifice and our atonement, our forgiveness, our covering, and to say, oh God, help me, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Help me to live the life that pleases you. Thank you for saving me. There's power in the life of the Christian. Every day we see God's mercies every morning. The Bible says the mercies of God are renewed every morning. That he will not let a righteous man falling. Why are we righteous? Because of our works? No. Because of how religious or how good Christians we are? No. We are righteous because we've been forgiven. 
the debts that we owe to God by believing in Jesus. God, in His amazing grace, He calls all those debts null, nullified. He does away with them, and He says, You owe me nothing now because you are in my Son, and you believe that He paid the debt of sin for you. It is that faith, the power of that life, that lives in the weakness of the flesh in which we still are, but that also sees the power of God manifested in us, the power of a faith that clings to the cross every day. You want to see a believer? Try to shake faith from his heart. You can't. We may have moments of doubts, moments of tribulation and questions, and struggles. But the child of God at the end of the day ends up trusting Christ and clinging to the cross. You can't pry him away from the Savior. There's nothing, no demon, no hell, no situation, no flesh that can pry us away from in our spirits clinging to the cross and to the power of the cross to save me and to justify me. That's why it says here that we are, this power is from God. It's not from us. And he goes on to say, we are hard pressed on every side. How many of you have been hard pressed on every side this year? Hard pressed. It's like being put in a what? In a tight place. Well, yes, the enemy can, can hard press us. But if you notice in Genesis 3.15... It says that the enemy, the seed of Satan, will strike the heel of the seed of the woman. That is the fight between Christ and Satan. Satan struck a blow to Christ, right? The crucifixion. But it was that very blow and that very death of the Son of God that God turned into victory when at the third day he rose from the grave. There was no wound and no blow that Satan could give the Son of God that could keep him down. In the same way, there is no blow. There's no strikes. There are no attacks that the enemy can give us and can put us under that will keep us down. Yes, we can be hard-pressed. God has been pleased with letting the world and letting God's people now in that situation. Why? Because in the midst of being hard-pressed, the glory of God and our witness for Christ and our faithfulness to Him will be shown for the honor and glory of who? Of God. It says we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Struck down, but not destroyed. That's what happened to Jesus. He was struck down, but he was not destroyed. He rose in victory. And you and I, as the seed of Christ, as a people that he came to redeem, we can be struck down, hard-pressed, persecuted, perplexed, oftentimes confused, in weaknesses, in tribulations, in illnesses, under attack, in persecution, in revilings by men, in rejection, uh, in scorns, in battles, with family and friends, if it's all for the name of Christ, the Bible says that you are blessed and that you are victorious and that you can be struck down but not destroyed. That is the kind of mindset we ought to have around the celebration of the birth of Christ. To be armed with a mindset that says we are in a battleground. In a battleground, we suffer. But in the midst of battles and sufferings, we overcome. The victory is ours. The victory belongs to the Lord. And I stand with Him. The Christ event, we see in Genesis, if we go back to Genesis, where it is announced 
the seed. Let's go now to Genesis. In Genesis 3, we see this annunciation. Let me take you to other places in Genesis where God repeats, where God reiterates the promise, the promise that there would be a seed, that the Messiah would come, that a, that a deliverer would come, that a redeemer, a savior would come. Let me take you to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we see the promise given to Abraham. Abraham. Verse, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says, The Lord has said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Was it Abraham that was going to be the blessing to all peoples? No. It was going to be the seed that would come through him. It was eventually the Christ, the Messiah, that would be the seed that was announced in Genesis 3.15. But now it is given unto Abram because God is beginning the history of redemption through Abram. And then through a people that he will raise in a, in a physical land. And eventually throughout the world and unto a promised, spiritual, eternal, heavenly land. That is why when we look at Hebrews, we hear that... Um, those that enter the promised land did not enter into rest because that was not what it was about. We hear in Hebrews that God has a rest for God's people. We hear in Hebrews of a heavenly place that Abraham left looking for a place whose building and architect is God. That Abraham was looking for a heavenly land. This was a revelation that God must have given these folks by his spirit. We see it in the word of God now. They were looking for the new Jerusalem. And who is in that new Jerusalem? That new city, that new organization of men and women. The church of God. We, the saints of God. You and I are here in this verse. You will be a blessing to many nations. How many of you consider yourself blessed? We've been looking at the book of, Ephe of Ephesians. And we've been talking about the blessing of God to God's people, which is being in Christ, which is being in Him and knowing Him and having a, an eternal inheritance with Him. It is announced here, if we keep going, it is reiterated again and again. Go to uh, Genesis chapter uh, 17. Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> It says now when Abram was old, when Abram was 90, Genesis 17 verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. <laughs> Who is here? you and me. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, he who is of faith is a what? Is a child of Abraham. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of the leaders among the Jews believed that this was only for them. For them. But the Apostle Paul opens up in the New Testament. It's here also in the Old Testament, but it is more clearly explained for us in the New Testament that we are Heirs of grace in the faith of Abraham. If you go, you go on to Genesis chapter um, 18. Genesis chapter 18. Verses 17 and 18, it says, Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him 
For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. The Lord will bring about for Abraham. And if he, will, and if he brought it about for Abraham, he's brought it about for you and for me and for God's people. Let me take you to Genesis 17. The seed that was promised... Then it began through the line of, uh, of Abraham's family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then the tribe of Judah on through Christ. Let me show you in Genesis 17, verse 19. Genesis 17, verse 19 says, Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. <laughs> Praise God. Folks, this is what we read about in Romans chapter 9. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And Isaac and then of Rebekah there will be twins. But then it will be according to the election of God. And then through Rebekah we know that it came through Jacob. And through Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, and of those 12 tribes of Israel, through the tribe of Judah came the Messiah, and then in the Messiah, onto the nations, and onto this, the Israel of God, including now in one people, putting down the separating wall, pushing down the differences that existed between Jews and Gentiles, and bringing them into the same household of faith, the church. The ecclesia, the called out ones of God. We have been called out of this world unto him. We have been called out of condemnation, of rebellion. We have been called out from participating in this world and following the current of this world unto being set aside for the seed, for Christ, for the Messiah. This seed would inherit and receive a ruling throne. It is promised to this seed as well. Let me show you in Genesis 49. The prophecies now that there would be a king. Somebody that would rule. Genesis 49. In Genesis 49 verse 10. Listen to what the word says here. Genesis 49 verse 10. Verse 10. The scepter. What's a scepter? You remember kings? Kings would rule and they would have this instrument, right? It would be called a scepter. It would signify their authority, their seal, to command, to rule, right? It says in Genesis 49 verse 10, it reads, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his, his folks. It's right here in the Word of God prophesied thousands of years before Christ came. From the tribe of Judah, this ruler will come out. And it's not just be at the tribe, the physical tribe. It's going to be a mighty ruler from God. We're going to see that. Let me take you to Isaiah. We read that this morning. Let me show you who this ruler is, who this king is. It's not just another king. It's not just another earthly ruler. Isaiah chapter 9. Beginning in verse 6. But for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be... On his shoulders. <laughs> How many of you are looking forward to a government? Or a government that will not be of Democrats or Republicans or anybody in between. Or a government that will have no more earthly rulers. Or a government in which justice will not suffer anymore. Or a government in which truly there will be peace in new heavens and new earth, a government that will not be overthrown, attacked, or terrorized, a government that will be mighty above all. Whose government is that? And who is this ruler? 
He says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. <laughs> that amazing. That's who we have as our God. A wonderful counselor. He who comforts us in our tribulations. He who also counsels us during the vigils of the night when we cannot fall asleep and we toss and turn. If we are with him and walk with him and give ourselves to him, he will bring his soothing counsel unto us. He will teach us. He will lead us to all peace in him. Wonderful counsel, mighty God. This government is a government from God. From God to God's people. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. No end. He will reign on David's throne, the throne of Judah. Because he was prophesied as we saw it. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. How many of you cry out for righteousness and justice? We mourn. We mourn sin. You know who a believer is? A believer is one that mourns sin and longs for righteousness. Do you mourn the sin that is in you? And you cry out, God, please, I can't wait for the day that you'll put it all away from me. I can't wait for the day that we'll no longer see this dirt of sin in me. I can't wait for the day that I will only please you forever because you will have put away from me this weakness and this tent and you will have closed me with immortality and glory. That's where it begins. Crying out for justice begins. Not, just, not crying out for legal justice. That's fine. And we cry out for that too. And the world... But crying out for justice begins by mourning your own sinfulness. By mourning the sin that every day warfares against your soul and against the spirit. That's a believer. A believer is one in whom the spirit of God lives. And the Bible says the spirit of God yearns for us. How? Intensely. With great zeal, this king has come into your heart to rule your life. If you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you don't see this in you. All you see is rebellion. All you see is happiness in your sin. All you look to do is always justify your hardened ways and your rebellion against God and to create gods for yourself and to say, that God you're talking about, preacher, that is not my God. You could say that, but you're going to dash on the rock one day because he's coming. And he's no longer coming on a donkey. He's no longer coming to wear a crown of thorns. He's no longer coming to be spat upon and to be humiliated and to be delivered by the hands of sinful men. He did that once to save sinners. He did that once in the humiliation of the incarnation of Christmas, of his birth, and took the abode here. The Word became flesh and left glories in heaven and a ruling throne at the right hand of the Father to save you and me. How about that? Grace, the grace of God got up close to you and said, I love you. I've come to die for your sins. I am your Savior. And now the people of God willingly receive him. As touched by the Spirit, we see Him and we bow down to His kingship and lordship. Even though now things may not appear in this world as if He is ruling. Because there's still what? Enmity and warfare. 
But make no mistake about it. It says he's coming. He will reign with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of God will accomplish this government. It will not be a government elected by the people. It will not be a, go a democratic government. It will not be a representative government. It will be the government of whom has always had the government. God creator, the mighty God of the universe. That to whom we should bow down every day of our lives. But people now go on with their rebellion and keep turning their backs on him. And keep saying nothing will happen. They say that he's coming for long now. Oh, look at him building that ark. Look at old Noah. He's crazy. Look at them Christians that have gone crazy saying that Jesus is coming back and that he's going to reign. No, the world is advancing. We, with our legislation and human advances, we are advancing the world. One day, the ruler will come out of Zion and he will show forth his righteousness and his terrible wrath on his enemies. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. That it is a horrendous thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Oh, for his children, grace and mercy. Grace and mercy every day. And I lift you up again and I restore you. And I pour the balm of Gilead. I pour Christ into your wounds. And I restore you every day. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. But on the enemies of Christ... There will be retribution and things will be made right. How many of you can wait? How many can say, I can wait, Lord. I don't have to take vengeance upon my own hands. I don't have to show myself vindictive. I don't have to show myself wrathful. I don't have to take it upon my own hands. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I will rule the nations. And we can wait. And we cry out for mercy now. We preach this gospel now. The same way that Noah said, get into the ark. And no one did. The same way now we preach this gospel and say, get onto Christ. Get onto the cross. Run to Jesus. There's only forgiveness in him. Bow down before him. See him as Lord and Savior. But only a few come in. Many are called, the Bible says, but a few are chosen. We move on and we see the unique birth. Let me take you to Micah. Let me take you to the book of Micah, chapter 5. Other prophecies as our time is running out this morning. Micah, chapter 5. Listen to this, folks. You know where Jesus was born, right? Where? In Bethlehem. You know that Bethlehem was a very small, insignificant town? If somebody were to say, I'm going to create a story for a king to be born, you wouldn't have him be born in Bethlehem. It's like saying, I'm, I'm going to have Jesus be born where? Give me, give me a town here in the States that's like, you know, unknown. <coughs> or here in, in South Florida. You would say, let him be born where? In, in Cor Gables, right? Or Hollywood. Right? Let him be born in some place worthy, some place renowned. Bethlehem. And you know what? Micah, 500 years, no, 700 years before he was born, said where he would be born. Isn't that amazing? Notice where it says in Micah chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratha, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. <gasps> Not amazing? The prophecy of where the Savior would be born 
in that little town of Bethlehem Ephrata, one whose beginnings are from old. You know how old? From eternity. That's what it says. One who is the eternal one will be born and will come and will manifest himself to the world from Bethlehem Ephrata. <laughs> that amazing. We can trust the Bible. We can trust our God. He would be born of a, vir of a virgin, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4, born of a, vir of a virgin because he was the Holy One of God. He was fully man, but he was also fully God. Took upon himself flesh, but he was also the one come from the Father, the Emmanuel. Isaiah 7 verse 14. It says there, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which translated is God with us. The unique birth, the revealing titles we, we already saw, Emmanuel, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And lastly, in Isaiah 53, the redemptive mission. How can people read this and not see Jesus as a Messiah? today. Isaiah 53. Let me begin reading for you and we're going to close with this. Isaiah 53 beginning in verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. <laughs> Isn't that a great mission? He came to take up my infirmities. What infirmity? My sin. My sin not in part but the whole as the old hymn says, he was, it says, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed <laughs> the burden bearer the compassionate savior the sin bearer the savior the meek one of God that came and then it goes on to say we all like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned his own way and the Lord has laid in him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was stricken for you and me, family. That's what that seed, what that Messiah was coming to do. To bear upon him the sins of his people. So that God would no longer count it against us. So that we would be delivered and forgiven. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Remember, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. He died between two thieves. He died with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, yet he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man. Prophecy fulfilled. It goes on to say, Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see... Jesus will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after the suffering of his soul he will see the light of life and be satisfied you know what Jesus is satisfied because he saw you and me being raised with his fall he saw you and me being healed by his wound 
After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Oh, child of God, this is the Savior that we proclaim. This is the Lord that now in Christmas and all throughout the year we preach. This is the child that was born. He was born to rule. But before ruling, he was born to die. And he was born to die for sinners, just as you and me, that we by faith could now be reconciled with him and rise unto new life as he rose again from the dead. It is my prayer this morning that this faith may be in your heart, that this will be a time that you will say, how can I not serve him? How can I not follow him? How can I continue to walk with the world? How can I not embrace my Savior who died for me and live in thanksgiving to him every day? How can I not in the midst of trials and sufferings unfold, not every day get up and say, I love you, Jesus, for you loved me first and I give myself to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We have summed up today the message, the gospel, the true Christmas perspective. I pray that we may take it home, continue to ponder in our hearts. I pray that faith will grow stronger each day. And I pray that your people, Father, will grow in that grace this year even more that we will grow closer to you, Father, that we will delight in you this year and in the peace that you have brought to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask you all things, acknowledging our sins and trusting and resting in the name that is above all names, Christ Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the love of Christ, and we'll see you Wednesday for Bible study and next Sunday. Blessings. Bendiciones.